Okay, great. So can you first of all just say and spell your name, please? It's Mark Nason, M-A-R-K-N-A-I-S-O-N. Great. And um, to start us off, would you please just give me an autobiographical sketch, uh, and this can be as elaborate as you'd like it to be, uh-huh. but just kind of your own trajectory through um, institutions of higher ed, the right. kinds of places you've been, the kinds of positions you've held, okay, the sure. kind of institutions you've worked right. in. Okay, I uh, was an undergraduate at Columbia College from 1962 to 1966. Uh, then I went to get a doctorate uh, at Columbia in American history, got my master's there in 1967, uh, my doctorate in 1976. Uh, I took a while off to make the revolution in the 60s. Um, in the summer of 1968, I began teaching African American history in the Upward Bound program of Columbia, and my first teaching position. Uh, I took in the fall of of 1970 in the Institute of Afro-American Studies at Fordham University. Uh, I was, to my knowledge, the first white scholar ever hired by a black studies program or uh, department. Uh, That uh, program uh, morphed over the years into the entity that I'm in now, which is the Department of African and African American Studies. So I've been at Fordham since fall of 1970. Uh, I began as an instructor. I'm I'm now a professor. Uh, I'm also uh, a faculty member in the history department. At various points, I've directed the Urban Studies program at Fordham actually directed it for about 36 years. In more recent years, I founded a major community-based research project called the Bronx African American History Project. But basically, my entire life in higher education has been in two institutions, Columbia and Fordham. That's uh, very unusual. These yeah, days. yeah, and, uh, and, and of course, in only one city. Mm-hmm. So and I've only lived in either Brooklyn or Manhattan. Mm-hmm. So uh, when I went to Columbia, I, I, I lived in Manhattan from basically 1962 to 1976. Then moved back to Brooklyn. Uh, we bought uh, half of a brownstone in Park Slope and have been there ever since. Mm-hmm. So, you know, my life has been very geographically confined and mm-hmm. basically two institutions. Uh, and I, to my knowledge, I mean, the only other school that I've taught in during, in a couple of summer programs was Long Island University. Mm-hmm. I've never been a guest scholar uh, for any extended period of time at a university outside New York uh-huh, City. Uh-huh. So there's a lot of talk um, among people at all levels in education um, about the the kind of sweeping changes in, in education over past decades, and now you've been on the ground here for some 40 years. Can you talk a little bit about um, what strike you as the most significant changes in either in this particular institution or in, in higher education in general during the time that you've been teaching? You know, I've my own position has changed very, very little. Uh, and and I've had a very unusual career because I always put teaching above research, even though you know I've done a significant amount of research and probably you know have something of a reputation in the field. For me, working with students and mentoring students has always been really significant. And I think by now, there have been more than fifty students of mine who are now professors around the world and have and have actually written their own books. And so this kind of mentoring has been, you know, something that has been the focal point of my life at this university. As I look around me, it is precisely what I have done, which is being rendered obsolete by two kinds of changes taking place. One, the the turn toward adjunct labor and the elimination of tenure-track positions, and then online learning. So I see myself as a dinosaur, you know, I'm somebody who still mentors dissertation, who still, I mentor all the undergraduate senior theses in urban studies. So I get to work with a lot of students individually who become, in effect, 
you know, my students for life. Mm -hmm. I probably have a, a, a thousand former students who I'm in touch with who actually are a great resource for me in any kind of political activism. But I, what I fear is that that one-on-one -on -one relationship with students and the community building that I do with groups of students, that that's going to disappear. Mm -hmm. What are the signs of that? I mean, specifically, what are the things that you see here that are the, the warning signs? It's, it's, it's that, you know, the, again, they're not so much in my department, which is, we don't use, but, you know, I think in history, probably half the courses are being taught by, you know, graduate students and in, of, the, of the introductory courses. Uh, and I, the latest figures that I've seen around the country is that half of the teaching is now being done by, you know, part-timers and adjuncts. And, and then, I mean, we have not gone very heavily into MOOCs or, 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 or online teaching. Um, now, and so I don't have any experience with that. But, I, again, what I fear is that the interpersonal and the community building, relationship building, are going to be pushed aside. And I worry about that because um, I think that to me is, 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 is the best part of university teaching. I was lucky enough to get that at Columbia. Uh, there were professors who invited me to their house for dinner when I was an undergrad at Columbia. There was one professor, James Shenton, have you ever heard of him? Absolutely. I mean, who did that constantly, but when I got in all sorts of trouble you know, and got arrested. He helped raise money for me. And then when they tried to kick me out of Columbia for beating up a right-wing student in the demonstration, he and other faculty members got them to change it to permanent censure rather than expulsion. So I benefited from, I was a kid from Brooklyn, you know, with a chip on my shoulder, and these faculty members allowed me to become, you know, a scholar and teacher. I mean, and I try to do the same thing, especially for students who come from working class, you know, backgrounds and first generation college students, students of color. A lot of my students who've gone on to get doctorates and write books com came from similar backgrounds that, that I did. And I worry we're going to lose that. Mm -hmm. And this will, in a f and I worry that all these changes are going to be another way of freezing the class structure. They, that... You know, I've spent a lot of time, not only as a teacher, I've been a coach. You know, I've, I've coached baseball, basketball. I've worked with a lot of kids who come up the hard way. And I am convinced that mentoring, nurturing, individual attention is what really works best. You know, almost half adopting kids and, and shaping them. And I could talk a lot about things I did with teaching and coaching. You lose that, you're, those kids are not going to people like me or like some of the young people I work with are not going to be able to become professors who come from working class and poor families. So I worry that this path of convenience and of, uh, I mean, and, and yeah, so it's prop, ex, online learning expands opportunity in some ways, but I also worry that by it's going to foreclose opportunity in others. By eradicating the kind of mentoring that is... Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's what I worry about mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and Fordham, I, my joke about Fordham is I call this now the Bronx College of Gentrification. Because never has the gap between the students here and the students in the community been greater. This is now an upper middle class school. We have fewer and fewer students who are coming from, you know, Bronx immigrant working class neighborhoods. We, 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 we look at, you know, it's paying customers that drive. We have a significant number of students from China, but, you know, the American students are largely upper middle class suburbanites. When I first came here, this was more a commuter school. A lot of the kids here were first generation college. You know, in his course I teach, like the working, the worker in American life, I'll get some of those first gen, but there's so few. Mm -hmm. And this is the product of intentional engineering on the part of the I, administration. I think it's 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 economics. You know, uh, you want people who can pay the tuition, uh, and um, 
so the, the, the you know and the, the numbers there's this book uh, what is it color and money how rich white kids have won the battle over college affirmative action which says that if you're in the top 20 percent you're 20 times more likely to attend the top college than being in the bottom 20 percent I just think this is happening everywhere, but I see it at Fordham. This is not the mm -hmm. same Fordham that I came to. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're more global. We, we have Muslim students. We have South Asian students. We have Asian students. We didn't have that before. But the Bronx kids aren't there mm -hmm. or in significant yeah. numbers, and I miss that. I want to come back in a minute to the, the changes that you're describing and go deeper into your own analysis of them. But first, let's, I want to go back to something you said earlier about um, the students, well, your your own experience and the kind of mentoring that you got and then in subsequent years that you, you prided yourself in giving. Can you talk a little bit about in the 40-some years that you've been teaching, how would you describe the kind of change over time when it comes to your own students' expectations? I don't see a difference. I mean, it's it's interesting. It's maybe it's because I'm just so goddamn aggressive, and people don't come to me with expectations. They come in like, "Oh, this is Nason, you know. I know what he does to people." You come to me, like I have the senior seminar, where I have them write fifty, sixty-page senior research theses in one semester, and I have a sign that says, "Panic now, not at the beginning of the semester." I lock the door at 8.35. If you're, it's a Friday morning. If you're late, you don't get in. So I have this, I create this aura of a combination of what I call intimidation and high expectations and also fun. So, and I've always done this. It's part of my, I sort of, the, the, the theater of my personality. Mm -hmm. So I don't, the students come in, you, you know, they know I'm going to push them. They know it's going to be fun. They know it's going to be funny. And at the end of it is something they're going to be proud of. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it's funny. I may, I've created this little bubble for myself where nothing has changed, you know. And also, I have the administration sufficiently trained to put, basically let me do whatever I want. How long did it take you to get to that point? probably 10 years, uh -huh. you know. I, I got, to, you know, I published a lot very early. Um, and uh, so I was full professor by, I guess, you know, before I was 40 years old. And because of all kinds of things, like where my, my wife was is now a principal who lives five blocks from where we live, my kids and all, I basically decided I wasn't going anywhere. So this is going to be my job, and then I could do all sorts of things outside. So Fordham kind of got the point. A, you know, in my field, I'm pretty well known. B, I have a lot of friends in the media. And C, I'm crazy. So basically, I get a free pass. <laughs> okay. Let's come back to the, your, your students' <laughs> expectations again. What about... Um what about their broader kind of life expectations in terms of what they want to do, what they wow. think they can do um, once you know, they walk I, through I, the door? For I them? don't think there's much. Again, it's, I think, I don't see that much of a change. I think people now see the job market as harder. They, okay, I think the biggest change is internationalization. In the last 15 years, more and more of my students study abroad, and get their first jobs abroad. Uh, so people expect that they may have to teach in China, Taiwan, Chile, Dominican Republic. Europe is rough these days. But everybody studies uh, abroad. In you know, About half of my students have, have studied abroad. 30 years ago, 10%. Um, I also get more international students, but, you know... That's maybe 10% of the, the, the group I... I don't see that many, much of it. I see the change more in the class structure, you know, mm -hmm. more... Which you would describe how? Um, more students from two professional college families, uh -huh. you know, and less from, like, less students who are first-generation 
you know, uh, college. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, again, it's... I, I, and I don't think my experience is... So much of what I do involves this thesis mentoring. Mm -hmm. Like, there are, you know, 20 other faculty members in our, in our undergraduate urban studies program, but my role has always been supervising the theses, and no one else wants to do that, really. So I get to shape these students. It, it's, and it's, it's fun for me, because I was somebody whose senior thesis really changed my life. You know, I wrote a senior thesis at Columbia on the rent strike movement in New York. Um, it got me, it probably helped get me fellowships. It got me the award as the top history student. I was hired by Francis Piven to spend the summer finishing the thesis. I got to read it on the radio in WBAI, and then I it got published in Radical America. So I'm like, I see the senior thesis as a life changer, which it was for me. So I convey that, to, and that's, you know, some of the most fun that that I do. And, um, you know, you've probably heard of Brian Purnell, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like he was one of my thesis students in his book and core in Brooklyn began as a senior thesis. You know, there's a, a bunch, of, in his year alone, there were three college professors came out of the book, the group of, with three different books. So this is... I've created, I've tried to reduplicate for students what I had at Columbia, you know. Mm -hmm. And I've done it by basically putting myself in a bubble and saying just, you know, leave me alone, let me do this. Well, let's talk more about that because that's kind of fascinating. I mean, it's, you're not quite saying that you're able to do this mentoring work in spite of the institution, but you are kind of saying you do it without the institution, right? The institution provides the students, and, but, you, and, but you're very much doing your own thing. Yeah, and, and my own thing, but they also, I'm respected for doing it, because on some level, Fordham does have this Jesuit mission of, you know, of, of developing young people as conscious, you know, men and women for others as socially conscious citizens. So I have a personal relationship with, like, the president of Fordham. Like, we email each other at 5 a.m. He knows that I go after Arnie. He hates Arnie Duncan as much as I do, but he can't say what I can say. He, I mean, I think on some level, they, the administration feels, in my own bizarre way, I'm embodying the Jesuit mission. Of, of the pastoral mission of the mentoring, the guidance, and producing socially conscious students. Mm -hmm. So I can carve this out, and everybody is 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 cool with it. But it's not that anybody else is going to do it, right? You know, because it's it's not this. Most people won't work that hard. You know, or you know, most people are pro who are at my position in the field are probably more invested in their scholarship than I am, you know. Um, and then, um, so I, 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 it's, if I leave, I don't know if anybody's going to do this, which is why I have no intention of retiring until, you know, I collapse. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that our, our, this current generation of graduate students is being trained to do this, to, be, to kind of take up this kind of, of role? No, because they're not getting it themselves. I mean, Melissa, te you know, you know, I, I, the kind of work that I put in with a student of Melissa, she's probably not going to get in grad school. Uh, you know, she's going to get some inspiration from great teachers, but the personal attention, probably not. Um, I think that in that sense... But, but it's hard to say. You know, I I'm occasionally have doctoral students, and one of them who I'm working with now, and by the way, she's a, this is part, she's writing an absolutely mind-blowing dissertation on the crack epidemic in the Bronx out of all these recently donated collections we've got. So, I don't know. You know, I don't want to blow my own horn too much, 
But all of the early, like, research directors of the Bronx African American History Project came out of the NYU History Department, where I kind of put them under my wing. And um, through Brian, and Brian brought in Maxine Gordon and Natasha Lightfoot. So they were not necessarily getting that there, you know. And it's partly because, you know, some scholars are moving around from place to place, and others are more, you know, invested in their own work. I mean, I'm more of a, a James Shenton than a Richard Hofstadter, you know, in terms of how I saw myself. I, you know, I, I was lucky enough to, you know, have Richard Hofstadter work with me for a couple of years before he passed away, but... You know, he would only take a couple of, you know, students, and he was kind of shy, and, you know, he wasn't going to be taking people out to dinner and stuff like that. So that, Shenton is who I modeled myself on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if we're producing people like that in, in our graduate programs. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, it's partly, Fordham is not a big-time history program, so, you know, it's not like I, I, I really know what's going on at these, in the other programs. You know, pay, I, I'll mentor dissertations at NYU or Rutgers or Columbia. You know, I'll be brought in as a, you know, an outside reader. But I don't know enough. But I think that the, men, the, the, the mentoring and training to be teacher, mentor, scholars, I don't see it happening mm -hmm. too much. Mm -hmm. it, but I, I can't say that's a, uh, I don't have enough experience to, to, to say that with confidence. Okay. Okay. Let's go back to the structural changes that you were describing earlier. You were talking about the economy and the kind of economics of higher education. Um, there are a lot of phrases you hear um, recently, the corporate university, the neoliberal university, um, can you talk a little bit about, like, what's, what's the paradigm that is most useful for understanding the state of higher education in terms of, of the political economy of education right now? And, what, um, and, and I, I think I use the higher education bubble. Okay. Uh, I think that higher education has become basically an unsustainable model because you, uh, so many of the, of the universities invested in services outside the classroom, in, you know, dining halls and gymnasiums and luxurious residence halls with the assumption that uh, the funds to pay for those would come from young people who would be going into uh, a, a job, a, a positive, you know, a job market which would allow them to to pay back the loans necessary to pay those things. Well, it turns out that we're cre six out of the ten new jobs we're creating in this country are going to be entry-level minimum wage. So the whole model of higher education, and, and there was an arms race between schools who would have the best food, who would have the nicest fitness room in the residence hall, who would have the best study abroad program, and they overinvested. And then some pro schools overinvested in law schools at a time when the legal profession was collapsing. So I think you're going to have an, a higher ed bubble that is going to be like, you know, the, the credit card bubble, you know. And so the schools are realizing how they're going to pay the, the interest charges on all these new facilities they built. The only way to do it is to find cash customers in other societies like China which is Fordham's, like, cash cow now, uh, or else uh, go after upper-middle-class students uh, who can pay, you know, a decent portion of the tuition. So I see a lot of universities going under in the next 10 years. Yeah, I was going to ask, so what does that crash look like? I mean, what's, what do you predict? I don't know. I think that a certain percentage of small private colleges are going under. Uh... A certain percentage of state, in, there's going to be consolidations of state institutions. And there are going to be models, uh, you know, of, 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 of less expensive ways of getting a degree. 
because there, there, I see no prospect of the job market significantly improving. So going into debt to get a degree is not economically rational for, you know, for most people. So I, I see like schools like Fordham, which are in better shape than some, they're scrambling around for how they're going to handle this. A combination of cutting costs and bringing in revenues. So a lot of it means, you know, going to China for, for, for students who can pay full tuition. So Fordham will get, you know, plus cutting programs, like a number of our graduate programs have been eliminated, uh, they've been, you know, hiring freezes and so forth, and um, I think that some, but some institutions won't be able to make the transition. So, uh, and then in the process, there are going to be other pe institutions coming in who are going to try to provide a much more low-cost education. Because the job market is not going to sustain, you know, uh, this kind of level of student debt. And I see it with my students now. They're just, just not getting job, you know. Uh, they're not getting entry-level jobs with benefits and decent salaries right out of college unless they go to another country. Mm -hmm. um, so, speaking as a historian, when... How might this situation have been averted, and when would that have had to have been? God. I don't think... I have to go back to the Clinton years when people made a decision that deregulation of the financial industry and encouragement of debt was the only way out of stagflation. And all sorts of things were set in motion at that time from the subprime mortgage bubble to the credit card bubble to the higher ed bubble. And I don't think that at the time I had, I, I know I had no idea these things were going on. I, did, I didn't begin to understand them until the crash in 2008. Then I began to look back and it all kind of goes back to Clinton. I mean, you know, some of it goes back to Reagan, but a bunch of it goes back to Clinton. Um, and Everybody was riding the wave, assuming, well, we'll pay for the, you know, we go into debt. Everybody's going into debt. I mean, look at the, and my, my, my students had credit cards forced on them, you know. So student loans, well, why not? It was, that was what's going on 10, 15 years ago. That... I think yeah, if I look at it, it's, it's the same st student debt started escalating at the same time that people were throwing credit cards at kids. And I, th I would guess 10, or f 10 to 15 years ago is when I started noticing that. And that, and, and um, it was because it was happening across the board, and everybody and so many people seemed to be able to um, get resources that their actual incomes didn't allow them to, it's very seductive. Mm. So given that we are in this place, what are the kinds of what are the kinds of policy initiatives that might help us get out of it? And I mean both kind of in, in terms of governance but also in terms of university administration. God. You know, I've been I think we're basically totally fucked. I was afraid you might say that. Uh, and because I've been thinking so much about public ed, where I've been drawn in, I don't, I don't, I haven't thought about it. I think we're seriously fucked. I think as a country, we're seriously fucked. Um, wow. I, I haven't... You know, because it's not been my responsibility. I've been, you know, I, I have all these ideas about K through 12. Yeah, well, I, I want to hear more about that, too, because I think often there's a disconnect in our public 
kind of vernacular discussions about education where higher ed is one thing and K-12 is another. And actually, I mean, it, first of all, it, it shouldn't be that way. Yeah. Um, and at some level, it's not that way. So it's just the discussion has kind of created... Okay, now you're forcing me into creative thinking, which I haven't... I haven't been really writing much about the connection. Okay, I, I think that something dramatic has to be done about college access for working class and poor students. And it has, and it can't be done through technology. It has to be done through personal relationship, mentoring, community building. I think we have to start creating models of schools which have, you know, with the schools around the clock community institutions where teachers live in the neighborhoods where there's a tremendous amount of 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 arts and music and sports and you know and and hands-on science and farms where everybody is working together uh and and the schools are 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 creating whole personalities rather than test takers. And then we've got to radically cut costs in universities and emphasize the teaching mentoring element in it. I also think we have to have class and race-based affirmative action in every major institution in a way that we haven't had in a long time, along with this. But at the same time, we have to use technology to lower costs, but also incorporate the mentoring and relationship building in it, which means that the job of the teacher is needs to be much more of a teacher. And and that's going to be resisted at elite institutions by people, you know, who have had, you know, teaching one or two course, you know, two courses a year, get leaves of absence every, you know, uh, second year to do their research. I think we're going to have to try to get more teachers. If you want to do something about class and race polarities in America, you're going to have to have teachers put in the time to, you know, to, to help build students from, from those backgrounds up. Mm -hmm. You know, to work with them individually, to mentor them, to get to know them. And... Um, it's not something I've ever seen anybody talk about. So, you know, it, it, but I always say that mentoring and relationship building is the key to, to great teaching, especially with young people from backgrounds where the families are not highly educated. So I think we have to incorporate that into public ed and reincorporate it into higher ed. And uh, and without raising costs, mm -hmm. which means people are going to have to work harder. Right. It's interesting that you identify faculty as where the, the chief resistance will come from, and I, I can't say I totally disagree with that. But it seems to me that one of the other points of resistance will be um, administrations that are so kind of bewitched by the idea of cost effectiveness, that the kind of mentoring that you're talking about is is really costly, or at least looks like it, yeah. if, if what you have your yeah. mind on is the bottom line. Yeah, well, I think it's going to be resisted by both. Uh, every, first, yeah, it's I, I, I agree. The administrations are going to see this is just too damn expensive. But faculty are going to resist it because this is not what they've been trained to do you know and not, not that what they right. or feel or feel that they have time to do or they have time to do or will be rewarded for they would be penalized for this right which many of them would they, of course they would if any look the only reason i could do this is because i just published my goddamn ass off in my first 10 years here so that, you know, I basically bought myself 40 years. Mm -hmm. Is that the way you thought of it at the time? Yes. That was a strategy. My, I, my strategy was to save my department, I had to publish my ass off. Then, 
to get me the space, I had to publish my ass off. So I did. You know. And then, you know, I, I got the space and it worked with the students and even the institution began to realize what hey, what this guy's doing, it it's good for the students. But I I'm just I'm totally pet I I'm very pessimistic about higher education. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that certainly, I mean, the kinds of things that you're describing, you don't hear. You don't hear these being proposed as, you know, here's what higher education needs. What you do hear, or, or education in general, what you do hear is almost the complete inverse of that, yeah. which is the model like Teach for America, which I know is something that you've thought about yeah. a lot. Can you talk a little bit about okay. kind of how that works both... What it what it does kind of to college kids who go into it, but also what it does to the systems that they're yeah. entering. Yeah. See, you know, this is a, it's a very it's I've always felt because of my own experience as a young person from a working class family who became a professor, as someone who worked with working class and poor students and students of color as a teacher in the Upward Bound program, but also in college, but also as a coach. I took the kids as a coach no one else would take. The toughest, angriest boys. And they, it took me, them almost becoming part of my family. So I have very strong feelings that when you're talking about working in high poverty, high needs, you need people there for life. You need teachers for life. You need people in part of the community who the kids can come to in the middle of the call you in the middle of the night, five years after they had you. You know? And that's the opposite of Teach for America. You know, it's two years and out. These kids need lifetime mentors. No, I, and, and it's amazing to me how few people understand that. Maybe because I spent my life in the hood. As it, it, even though I'm this, I mean, I'm there. I'm still in the South Bronx, and but I'm it, I'm still connected with all these kids that I coached, that I taught, that I worked with, and I see that approach paying dividends in terms of their development as people. And and that's and you take that away, we freeze the social structure the social hierarchy. You're not gonna have people make that trans it's moving up the social ladder is tough. For me, I mean I have to get personal. I got to Columbia and I looked around. I had to change my haircut. I had to change the way I spoke. I had to change the way I dressed. It took a lot of time for me to get the confidence to be with people from you know wealthier backgrounds. I needed guidance, and I and those are the things I understand. I mean, you know, or, or I'll give you another example, and this is from baseball. Okay. Um, my son, Eric, who ended up pitching at Yale, there he is, you know. In the summer, he, he was very good by the time he was 15 or 16. So the top team in the city is youth service, coached by Mel Zitt and Manny Ramirez. It's a mostly Dominican team. So they, got, they, they asked him if he could come on to go upstate with him to a, a, a tournament they wanted him to pitch. He goes there, and they take the team to friendlies after a game and he realizes that no one else in the team had ever been in a sit down restaurant where they ordered from a menu and the team did that for them it took them to hotels the guy Mel Zitter who was a crazy authoritarian brutal coach he made every kid who played for them ended up with a junior college scholarship of being drafted. He made sure they stayed in hotels. He made sure they, you know, that's what you need to do. And you lose that. You fuck. These kids are fucked. They're not going to make it. People don't understand that. I, I mean, and maybe it's because I lived it myself. You know, it was like none of, none of the Barnard girls would go after you know, like the wealthier girls would go after me until I, you know, I had a change. Then once I did, you know, 
all these I, I saw you know I you, cl class mo mo race mobility it's rough stuff it's not as easy as it looks you know how are you going to do this through technology I get it you know that's the question so we're, we're doing everything wrong and the statistics show it highest child poverty rates the college, our colleges are becoming, our elite colleges are becoming more and more exclusive. Social mobility frozen in this country, less than in, in many other advanced societies. We're doing everything wrong. Mm -hmm. Is anybody going to listen to me, though? Hell no! Well, it's interesting because I think that most educators would agree with you that education is primarily social. That it, it can't be, it can't be a social. Is that raining? I think it is. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, education, good education, good mentoring can't be asocial. It has to be kind of in a social context and it has to be with real social engagements. Um, the new models, which mostly come from business, um, are not looking at it that way at all. Um, educators are, are merely content providers. Right. <laughs> right, and the students are customers. And the students are customers. Yeah. Is, I, in this culture, is there any way out of that in, in a culture where the momentum is so fiercely in that direction? Or to put it the question another way, I mean, one of the things that I've been thinking about is is how there's a kind of tug of war going on inside universities between educators and non-educators. Right. And I mean, do you have any advice for the educators in that fight? Clean up your own act first. Meaning? Start actually really mentoring students. Set an example of personal attention, going the extra mile, because I don't see it. I see it from some people, I don't see it from most. So, I mean, walk the walk, don't just talk the talk. Mm -hmm. And then, and fight to have your universities become multi-class, multi-race places. This, I see, this is getting me really depressed. <laughs> because, you know, it, it's sort of facing all the momentum, well, all the momentum, but, but you can also blow the whole thing up. Which is what we're doing with the badass teachers. Talk more about badass okay. teachers. <laughs> there was a, a yeah. There was a, been a lot of t anti testing activism among parents, and in, especially with the new Common Core Align test. And there was, a you know, March April of two thousand and thirteen. There was a big test revolt in New York State. Probably ten thousand families refused the tests. I kind of got involved in that, got involved with meeting some of the parent leaders, some of whom were actually conservatives and libertarians, which was a new, many of them from the suburbs. So, you know, I was very excited by this movement, and we started calling ourselves badass. Well, I've always been a badass, so that's easy for me, you know. So we formed a group called the Badass Parents Association, which we thought was pretty cool. We got three, four hundred people on Facebook in a couple of months. So this parent activist from uh, Oklahoma, Priscilla Sands, said, why don't we create a Facebook page, Badass Teachers Association. It was half as a joke. So Friday at 4.30, June 14th, 2013, we create this group. By the end of the weekend, we have 2,000 people. It turns out that teachers are unbelievable, all over the country are unbelievably pissed off at being demonized, blamed for not only the failures of the school, the failures of the society to do more about poverty, of being scripted, excluded from policy, told by business people who know nothing about teaching what they should be doing. So within two months we had 20,000 people and I had all these brilliant women who knew how to create organizational structures and new technology and new social media I became sort of the symbol of the unrepentant, badass teacher who would call out anybody. Because obviously, you know, I'm a tenured full professor. I can do say whatever the hell I want. But all these women who were badass in their classroom, but had been uh, suddenly... So now we have 50,000 members, 
50 state organizations, organiz strong organizations in Britain, New Zealand, and Canada. And we have a teacher's march in Washington on July 28th. We're going to surround the U.S. Department of Education. And it's all about saying, put the, put the teachers back in charge. Bring back love, creativity, and relationship building to learning. And let's, you know, appe appeal to the whole student. And uh, so that's, so it's, and, and everybody's scared of us. You know, you know, the, the, the teachers union, we're, we have caucus, caucuses in both teachers unions. You know, we're driving Cuomo totally crazy in New York. We're driving Malloy crazy. We have a very strong Connecticut BATS group, and they're running an, an oppositional campaign to Malloy. We're calling out the Democrats who have bought into the corporate education model, and we go, we, we're, you know, trying to get rid of Duncan. So it's been, it's, it's a mass movement mm -hmm. of angry, basically K through 12 teachers. We need angry professors. That, that is interesting, and it feels like that's mounting too, but let's, let's stay with the teachers for a second. Can you talk more about, it sounds like a very complicated relationship between badass teachers and the unions. Right. Um, see, the teachers' unions have, ba they basically made the decision that if they don't cooperate with the major, like, foundations and the leadership of the Democratic Party, they're going to be destroyed. So they took grants from Gates. They didn't take an oppositional position to the race to the top. Uh, policy, even though it was really, you know, uh, undermining uh, teacher creativity and autonomy and pushing testing into schools and leading to massive firing of inner city teachers. What we're doing is now, because we, they're, they're able to fight back and speak out against Gates and Duncan and Obama, because they said, well, look, we have these radicals. They're, we're like Malcolm X to their Martin Luther King. So Randy Weingarten used the word badass 12 times in her speech to the AFT convention. They know, they, they can use us to, for, to bargain, get a better bargaining position. On the other hand, we also want to get new leaders. So and they try to undermine us at the same time they have. You know, it's a very complicated relationship. They're threatened by us and helped by us at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's all sorts of stuff going on behind the scenes, uh, you know, both ways. But everybody knows who, you know, I guarantee you, you talk to Bill Gates, we've picketed the Gates Foundation, we've called for, they know who we are. Mm -hmm. Everybody, you know, I'm sure Cuomo, I, I have a, one more video i got to show you, okay. which is me attacking Andrew Cuomo. Uh, this is, it's, so, let me see, yeah, because this is all an outcome of badass teachers. Uh, the, uh, the education video, okay, let's see, uh, okay. This is the first one we ever did. I'm Mark Mason with the Education News. And the big education news story of the week is the education reform ad that New York Governor Andrew Cuomo is sponsoring at Lake Placid this coming weekend. The camp is billed as a weekend of fun, fellowship, and strategy with the nation's thought leaders in education reform. So who's going to be there? Is Diane Ravitch going to be there? Is Pedro Noguera going to be there? Is the great New York principal Carol Burris going to be there? No, because they might present dissenting voices to Governor Cuomo's vision of test-based teacher evaluation. Instead, we have the maker M. Knight Shyamalan, Louisiana Senator Mary Landrieu, and that great education expert, former NBA star Kevin Johnson, who is the mayor of Sacramento and also happens to be married to Michelle Reed. 
But this shouldn't surprise anybody when we look at who's funding this. It's Democrats for Education Reform and Education Reform Now. They're all Wall Street hedge fund managers. So I have decided to rename this great weekend Hemp Dallas. Of course, when Andrew Cuomo is involved, teachers are going to be screwed. I'm Mark Mason, and I'm talking to you, Andrew Cuomo. <laughs> so, you know, uh, no, we, 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 this is a totally in your face. So, that's great. Um, can you imagine usefully creating something like that as professors? And can you imagine usefully creating an alliance between such groups? Yes. I think it would be great to have a badass professors association. I can't. Uh, if somebody else would do it, we would. We would love it. We would love the support. We would love the alliance. We would love a vision of how to bring, you know, social mobility, social justice, mentoring, uh, a, you know, real affirmative action back to all levels of education. Mm -hmm. I think that would be an absolutely wonderful development. Mm -hmm. Because I do think that, that one of the, it's not the only, but one of the obstacles to the kind of mentoring that you're describing, and I totally agree with you about its importance, um, are structural issues around casualization. I mean, with, with and you started with this actually um, when we were first starting to talk, um, with such a huge percentage of courses being taught uh, by people who are more or less vulnerable, either they're, right. they're adjuncts or they're graduate students. Um, you just it's very hard to to make the, the both the psychic space but also the kind of institutional yeah, space I, for the well kind there of you would have to have maybe unionization of the part timers paying them decent salaries and giving them job security so that they could do that I think that would be an essential part of it I haven't thought that through but that's where we would need a higher ed initiative that involves unionization, security, and decent pay for the part-timers in order to bring back this kind of nurturing and mentoring. And um, we have to figure out a term for bringing upward mobility back to the United States, stopping the freezing of the class structure. We're becoming, you know, a, a, an oligarchy. So. What would higher ed have to do to undermine the oligarchy? Right now, it's reinforcing it. I mean, I, those are the kind of issues that would have to be taken, and it would require a lot of thinking, which I haven't done. But the, but you're push, you know, what you're saying is it could be done. It would be great to have a, an equivalent of badass teachers for higher ed. I think, in fact, the time has come. But. You need to, I cannot tell you how much work it is to do this. I mean, our, we have 250 volunteers who run this organization. You know, we, don't, we take no grants because we don't trust anybody who gives money not to interfere. We're in the term of vulture philanthropy. So what you would need is to find people who care enough to make this happen. But I guarantee you that our folks would s jump on the opportunity to work with you in a holistic vision. Absolutely. I mean, we jump up and down. People will say, Mark, where are the professors? I said, I don't know. I can't, you know, they're not there. Well, some of them are in our group, but most of them are ed professors. Mm -hmm. They're not a lot of, and we have a couple of other African American studies professors who are in this, but we need, we need a group like this for higher ed. A group of really crazy visionary scholars to, to point to say everything we're doing is wrong. Because that's what badass teaches. You're wrong. Every single thing you're doing is wrong. Whether you're Democrat or Republican, we start, you have to start with, this, with mentoring, relationship building. That's the key to education. That might be per a perfect place to stop. It's a great note to end on. Um, but is there anything we haven't discussed that you feel like we should have? You, no, because you forced me out of my comfort zone already. But if 
boy, wouldn't it be cool if an organization like Bad, Badass Teachers could be... I, I would... If that would come out of these discussions, if you know people ready to do this, I guarantee you we will put everything we have at your disposal in terms of our people, our resources, our social media. You know, we have a, we, 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 we have great, you know, we do all sorts of Twitter stuff. We can fucking harass people like you can't believe. We say, okay, this week Tennessee has a law to attack teacher tenure. We'll get 10,000 tweets directed at the governor, calls, you know. We, we do 911 calls to have our people from all over the country concentrate on one state. We could do stuff around higher ed if, some, if there was an order, but we need that organization. If you want to f know people want to start badass professors, we'll help you recruit, man. Well, maybe it starts with this tape being posted. Thank Whoa! You. <laughs> this, I mean, you know, this is, this is, this is crazy cool. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. I mean, um, yeah. And then there's the book. It, when, and 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 there's the book.